Thank you, Margaret, and thank all of you very much. I haven't heard such cheers since I told the Washington Press Corps I was leaving town. I don't know who cheered the loudest, them or me. <laughs> Frankly, for a minute there, I was a bit concerned that after all these years away from Washington, you all wouldn't recognize me. Heck, uh, Pretty soon, I'm going to have to get one of those credit cards with my picture on the front. <laughs> I can't tell you how thrilled Nancy and I are to be here with you tonight to celebrate, as Margaret said, the 44th anniversary of my 39th birthday. Haley told me he was going to gather a few friends for dinner tonight, but I had no idea. Before I get started here, I want to thank my dear friend Margaret Thatcher for being part of yet another important milestone. Another important milestone in my life and for those very kind words. As most of you know, Margaret and I go back quite a ways. We met at a time before she became prime minister and I became president. And the moment we met, we discovered that we shared quite similar views of government and freedom. Margaret ended our first meeting by telling me we must stand together. And that's exactly what we've done in the years since. As friends, <laughs> as friends and as political allies, Margaret Thatcher is one of the giants of our century. Her, her many achievements will be appreciated more and more as time goes on and history is written. For me, she has been a staunch ally, my political soulmate, a great visionary, and a dear, dear friend. Thank you, Margaret for being with us tonight. I would also like to convey my personal appreciation to Haley Barber. Haley, you and the entire Republican National Committee are doing an excellent job keeping the heat on the Democrats at both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue. Haley, back when I hired you to work on my White House staff, I suspected you might amount to something someday. <laughs> I must say that returning to Washington today really brought back memories. As our plane headed toward the airport, I looked down on the White House, and it was just like the good old days the Rose Garden, the South Lawn, David Gergen. <laughs> I looked over a couple of blocks, and there was the Internal Revenue Service, bigger than I ever remembered it. Then, then I looked down at the enormous United States Post Office building. I could just see the excitement on the faces of the bureaucrats, knowing they would soon be managing our national health care system. <laughs> uh, 
Up on Capitol Hill, I saw that big white dome bulging with new tax revenues. I instinctively reached for my veto pen <laughs> and thought to myself, go ahead, make my day. You may have seen President Clinton draw his own veto pen on television just last week. The difference is that his pen doesn't have any ink in it. <laughs> unless, unless, of course, you're talking about red ink. And we and we all know the Democrats have plenty of that. All of you have made our day just by being here. It's a pleasure to see so many familiar faces and those who work so hard for the grand old party, which which remain, reminds me I need to set the record straight once and for all on a certain matter that keeps coming up. I have to admit, I'm very flattered by all the telephone calls, the letters, the signs, and especially those bumper stickers. But with all I've got going in my life right now, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to run again for president in 96, 1996. However, I have not ruled out the possibility of running in the year 2000. <laughs> I, I hesitate to ask, but if I did run, could I count on you again for your support? <laughs> Seriously. Seriously. Seriously, birthdays often serve as the rare moments when we can pause from the bustle of our daily lives to reflect on the years that have passed, the accomplishments and people that have made them special. As I look around this gathering, I am filled with countless warm and fond memories. Many of you go back with us as far as my two terms as California governor. Others of you are more recent additions to the family. Regardless of when you came, you have been a big part of our lives. For that, we are so grateful and feel so blessed. Now, as most of you know, I'm not one for looking back. I figure there will be plenty of time for that when I get old. but rather what I take from the past as inspiration for the future. And what we accomplished during our years in the White House must never be lost amid the rhetoric of political revisionists. When, When, when we came to Washington on that bright, sunny day in January of 1981, we shared a dream for America. Back then, the reach of government had become intolerable. It was a time of rampant inflation and crushing interest rates when hope was scarce. It was a time when cold, ugly walls divided nations and human rights were tramped trampled in the name of evil and corrupt ideologies. It was a time when the nuclear arms race was spiraling out of control 
and a blinding mistrust stood between East and West. We believe that for the future of America and the free world, this could not stand. And together, we insisted that this great nation must once again behave as such. In our America, most people still believed in the power of a better tomorrow. So, so together, we got the government off the backs of the American people. We created millions of new jobs for Americans at all income levels. We cut taxes and freed the people from the shackles of too much government. And the economy burst loose in the longest peacetime expansion ever. We brought America back bigger and better than ever. It was, it was a time when America was a bright beacon of hope and freedom to oppressed people everywhere. The world looked to us not just because of our military might, but because of our ideas of liberty and freedom. And they knew we were willing to defend and promote those ideas in every corner of the earth. We, we rebuilt a demoralized, underfunded, and unappreciated military. And we made it the most modern and respected force in the world. And who can forget those so-called experts who said our military buildup threatened a dangerous escalation of tensions? What kind of fool they asked would call the Soviet Union an evil empire? I'm tempted to say there's no fool like an old fool. But as events have shown, there was nothing foolish in my prediction that communism was destined for the ash heap of history. After, after decades of struggle and with the help of the bold leadership of Margaret Thatcher, democracy won the Cold War, and the Berlin Wall came tumbling down. The world watched with amazement as we put our house in order and took our route rightful place as the most dynamic country in the world. And I firmly believe that history will record our era as one of peace, and global prosperity. However, our task is far from over. Our friends in the other party will never forgive us for our success and are doing everything in their power to rewrite history. Listening to the liberals, you'd think that the 1980s were the worst period since the Great Depression, filled with suffering and despair. I don't know about you, but I'm getting awfully tired of the whining voices from the White House these days. Hey. They were claiming there was a decade of greed and neglect. But you and I know better than that. We were there. Oh, yeah. Although the political landscape has changed, the bold ideas of the 1980s are alive and well. 
Republican candidates swept every major election across the country last year, from New York to Texas, from New Jersey to my home state of California. And as And as a result, it seems that our opponents have finally realized how unpopular liberalism really is. So, so now they're trying to dress their liberal agenda in a conservative overcoat. After watching the State of the Union address the other night, I'm reminded of the old adage that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. <laughs> only, only in this case, it's not flattery, but grand larceny. <laughs> the, the intellectual theft of ideas that you and I recognize as our own. Speech delivery counts for little on the world stage unless you have convictions and, yes, the vision to see beyond the front row seats. The, the Democrats may remember their lines but how quickly they forget the lessons of the past. I have witnessed five major wars in my lifetime, and I know how swiftly storm clouds can gather on a peaceful horizon. The next time a Saddam Hussein takes over Kuwait or North Korea brandishes a nuclear weapon, will we be ready to respond? In the end, it all comes down to leadership. And that is what this country is looking for now. It, it was leadership here at home that gave us strong American influence abroad and the collapse of imperial communism. Great nations have responsibilities to lead and we should always be cautious of those who would lower our profile because they might just wind up lowering our flag. I don't think an event of this kind would be complete without, well, something that you probably got used to during my days in Washington, one of my stories. It's a, it's a story about a woman who walked into a bridal shop one day and told the sales clerk that she was looking for a wedding gown for her fourth wedding. Well, the saleswoman asked, just exactly what type of dress are you looking for? A long, flowing white dress with a veil, she responded with assurance. Not totally convinced, but afraid to offend the woman, the sales lady said, you know, dresses of that nature are usually more appropriate for brides who are being married for the first time, for those a bit more innocent, if you know what I mean. Well, the lady retorted and put her hand on her hip, I do know what you mean, and I can assure you I'm as innocent as the rest of them. Despite all my marriages, I remain as innocent as any first-time bride. Well, you see, my first husband was a dear, sweet man. It was a terrible tragedy, actually. All the excitement of the wedding was simply too much for him, and he died as we checked into the hotel on our wedding night. I'm sorry to hear that, said the clerk, but what about the others? Well, my second husband and I got into a terrible fight in the limousine on the way to our wedding reception. We haven't spoken since and got the marriage quickly annulled. What about your third husband, asked the store clerk. Well, the woman replied, uh, he was a Democrat. 
And every night for four years, he just sat on the edge of the bed and told me how good it was going to be. Sorry, I just couldn't resist telling that. <laughs> My friends, on a serious note, I would like to end by telling you something that Nancy and I have wanted to say to you for a long time. During our years together, here, as you know, things were always on the move. As soon as we accomplished one objective, we were quick on to the next. There was rarely time to celebrate victory or recall all the people who made it possible. Well, one of the benefits of retirement is you get a chance to reflect back over the years. Since Nancy and I have returned to California, we've spent many occasions looking back at what we did here and remembering the extraordinary people who worked so hard to make those great days possible and we've wondered if we would ever get the chance to thank them. Well, you are those people, those great individuals who gave so much of yourselves, who sacrificed and supported us and helped us achieve everything we did. So I will conclude tonight by saying the greatest gift I could receive on my birthday is to be able to stand before each and every one of you and convey in the only words I can how grateful Nancy and I are. Thank you for being there and for being here. And thank you for making this evening a memory I will cherish forever. And until we meet again, God bless you, my friends. Thank you.